welcome everyone to our first public event of not just the new quarter or even the new year, but the new decade. We are pleased to welcome Republican presidential candidate Joe Walsh to campus, and we look forward to his conversation with Monica Davey of the New York Times. As a reminder, the University of Chicago is a tax-exempt 501c3 organization. It does not support or oppose any candidate for political office. I do want to mention a couple of upcoming events. Tomorrow, we are hosting a live taping of the Axe Files podcast with the co-founders of Fusion GPS, the opposition research firm that produced the Steele dossier. Yes, that one. Um, next Wednesday, photographer KK Otteson will be here to discuss her new book of photographs and interviews with activists who have shaped American politics. She's photographed everyone from Angela Davis to Billie Jean King, John Lewis to Grover Norquist. She'll be sharing those portraits as well as her favorite moments from those interviews. You can find out more about these and other upcoming events at our website at politics.uchicago.edu. Uh, after the discussion, we will open up the floor to take questions from the audience. Please line up behind the microphone that's going to be in the center aisle. Remember that everyone is welcome at the mic. We do reserve the first three questions for students. And we remind you at the beginning of this new year that we uh, have questions that end in question marks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, please make sure that your phones are on silent, the restrooms are on the second floor, and here to formally introduce our speaker is Maddie Joseph. Maddie is a second year with a fan club in the audience from Wilmette, Illinois, <laughs> studying molecular engineering. During her time at UChicago, she has been involved in Policy Circle and the Society of Women Engineers, and this year she is the social chair for the College Republicans. Please join me in welcoming Maddie to the podium. Hi, everybody. I'm so pleased to welcome the many students, faculty, staff, and community members here tonight to this evening's exciting speaker series event hosted by the Institute of Politics. The IOP is thrilled to welcome our moderator, New York Times Chicago Bureau Chief Monica Davey, and speaker, former U.S. Representative, talk, show, talk radio host, Harris Scholar alumnus, and current presidential candidate Joe Walsh. Monica, in her capacity as bureau chief, covers the Midwest for the Times. A Chicago native, she has reported for various publications throughout her career, including the Chicago Tribune and World News, among others. Another Chicagoland loyalist, Joe has been serving the public even before his official political career began by teaching, conducting social work, fundraising, and advocating for important causes. Joe continued to demonstrate this dedication to his values and his community in the political sphere. Embracing the challenge of running for Congress against strong incumbents, in 2010, his tenacity paid off when he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives on behalf of Illinois' 8th District, beating out the incumbent whose chances of success were forecast as 88%. During his time in the House, he advocated for common-sense policies that emphasized free markets and limited government while making himself accessible and his stances transparent by holding 363 town hall meetings, more than any other member of Congress. After his term concluded, I'm sure he was at least a little excited he he didn't have to sleep in his office anymore. Uh, Joe ventured into the world of talk radio, where his, Joe, where his show, The Joe Wall Show, quickly skyrocketed in popularity and became nationally syndicated. Continuing his trend of commitment to the American people, as demonstrated by his long career in public service, Joe is now running for president in the 2020 elections. So now I hope everyone can see why I'm so excited about our guests. I encourage each of you to take this as an opportunity to listen and to be heard, to engage and to learn. And now, Joe and Monica. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Monica. It's good to appreciate be here. Appreciate it very much. Uh, so let's get started right away. Um, what in the world are you doing here? You should be in Iowa, shouldn't you? <laughs> I will be going to Iowa tomorrow. It is always a treat to come back to this campus. I went to graduate school. I love it here. But we'll be in Iowa. We're in Iowa a lot. Well, tell us a little bit about that. What, what are you seeing? Ha what is happening in Iowa? You're running around. The caucuses are imminent. Yeah. Uh, what, how are people responding to your candidacy? Look, it's a challenge because there's a, a vibrant Democrat race going on. Uh, I'm on the Republican side taking on a sitting president. It's, it's, uh, it's a battle to get attention, to get people to notice this race. But the refreshing thing is, and I say this all the time, when I can actually talk to Republican voters, because that's who I'm trying to talk to all the time, primarily in New Hampshire and Iowa, um, and you just talk to the voters. Even though 
they disagree with me on a lot of things when it comes to Trump. I think he needed to be impeached. I think he deserves to be impeached. I think he ought to probably be removed from office. But even though we disagree on impeachment, most Republican voters are exhausted. I hear that over and over. So your reaction, you're getting a warm reaction. Do people realize that not, you're running? Yeah, no, not from everybody. I mean, there are a lot of Republicans who are upset that I'm doing this. Um, look, Trump's got his solid core, and he can do no wrong with those folks. I've just been surprised. Again, I, undoubtedly, I hear from Republican voters a variation of the following. Hey, Joe, I like some of the things Trump's done. Um, but I'm just tired of it. I don't want to go through four more years of the tweets and all this other crud. And Joe, look at the Democrats. They're crazy. So what am I going to do, Joe? Now, I listen to that, and I think, well, there's a Republican who's really exhausted with Trump. If they had another alternative, you know, maybe there's a vote there. So you were a Trump supporter, though. You voted for mm -hmm. Donald Trump. Um, what changed? <laughs> Trump, me. Uh, look, I voted for Trump in 2016. Uh, not because I loved him, not because I liked him. He wasn't Hillary. And by the way, this, a, a lot of Trump voters went through this. I went to Congress in 2010. Uh, I was part of a populist Tea Party movement. The same people who voted for Trump voted for me. The same people who voted for Trump have listened to me on the radio for the last six years. These folks, like me, uh, were upset with our political system. I mean, I think both political parties have dropped the ball. I think our political system is broken, right? All these elites in Washington, everything Trump talked about, it's, it's really true. And so I understand what got Trump elected. The problem is Donald Trump is a horrible human being. I mean, a, I mean an, an absolute corrupt, horrible human being. And so this, this real genuine concern that the voters had, go, hey, go clean that up. Go clean up that swamp. Trump, Trump's, like, Trump's like the swamp creature. So I understand what got him elected. I did vote for him because I wanted a little bit of this disruption. But it became clear to me uh, in a nanosecond after he got elected, and if I'm slow to the dance, I'm slow to the dance, uh, that almost every time he opens his mouth, he tells a lie. So, but where was that moment, and where is that issue? What is the thing that... Is that me bumping? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you want me to... Uh, yeah. No, you, yeah, you can talk if you want to. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there a moment where that yeah, yeah, switched, yeah. So and what was it? There was a, there was a final straw. Uh, two things. Two things moved me off of Trump. Um, and again, I didn't love him or like him. And uh, when Donald Trump got elected, I was on the radio. I'm on conservative talk radio. And so I tried to do the whole good Trump, bad Trump thing. When he did something good, I'd praise him. When he did something bad, I'd criticize him. Uh, more and more and more, I didn't like what he was doing. The, the thing that really began to move me off of him, again, is his dishonesty. We've never, and this is big, Monica, I don't care what your politics are. We have never, ever in this country who had a president who lied, lies, almost every time he opened his mouth. I watched this for a few months, and I said, I, I can't abide by that. The final straw with Trump, with me, was in Helsinki of 2018. When Donald Trump stood in front of the world, it still blows me away. Donald Trump stood in front of the world, and he said, I stand with Putin. I believe Putin and not my own people. I was watching that at home. I had my dogs around me. I started tweeting. I was throwing things around the living room. I swear to God, the dogs were scared. I said, at that point, I'm done. This is the most disloyal person to sit in that office. That was the final straw for me. So tell us a little bit about your campaign itself. How many states will you be on the ballot in? You will not in your home state of Illinois, as I Which understand it. Me. So, so give us the lay of the land. How do you run this, this race? It's a, it's a long shot effort. At the end of the day, we'll probably be on the ballot in about 35 to 38 states. Now, maybe many people out here are asking, but Joe, why aren't you on the ballot in all 50 states? Um, well, think about this. And I was in a really bad mood yesterday. 
I'm still in a bad mood. <laughs> the state of Wisconsin, the latest state to disenfranchise Republican voters. The Republican Party of Wisconsin canceled their primary election yesterday. They said, we're only going to put Donald Trump's name on the ballot. This has happened in 10 states in this country. Republican Party bosses and Trump canceling primaries in 10 states. It's wrong. This shouldn't happen in America. We're doing whatever we can to fight against this. There are lawsuits, Monica, in some states, but it's made it difficult. But isn't that a recognition that you're, you, you don't have traction in those no, states? No, gosh, no. Because I'm on the ballot in California and Texas. So what's wrong with California and Texas? I'm on the ballot in Florida. I mean, I'm on the ballot all over the country. And by the way, I'm not the only Republican challenger to President Trump. Governor Bill Weld, another former elected official. I want everybody to understand, Monica, because this is really important. I know I live and breathe this, so it bugs the heck out of me. This has never happened before. You're talking about now nine, because North Carolina tried to do it, and they were overruled. But right now, in nine states in this country, Republicans will not be able to vote for president. This has never happened before. Uh, and, and, and you're talking about two former Republican elected officials running nationwide races against Trump. It's wrong. And by the way, if Donald Trump is so popular and so strong among Republicans, why the hell cancel primaries? I think they're afraid because I don't think he's that strong. So let's talk about your relationship with Donald Trump. Oh. <laughs> do, you, do you have a personal relationship with him? Have you met him? Um, <laughs> I've, I've never met him. Uh, he blocked me on Twitter during the 2016 campaign because I criticized him. Um, I was a radio guy after he got elected, and all of the radio people from our company, our syndicator, were supposed to do our radio shows on the White House premises. I was all excited to do my radio show from the White House, but the White House called my company and said, don't let Joe Walsh on, on the White House grounds because I criticized him. I don't have a relationship with him. So how do I don't you want a relationship with him. And he has responded to your candidacy, as I understand it, on Twitter at least. He's called Does me a failed one-term congressman and a loser on the radio. So what is your thought about what this does to your future in the Republican Party? Well, um, as it pertains to my future, um, I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> and, and Monica, I don't care. And, and I'm not trying to sound like some better than anything. Uh, I gave up my livelihood to do this. I'm not a wealthy guy. Um, I get threats every day. Uh, most of my Republican friends and supporters want nothing to do with me. Uh, I think this is a unique moment in American history because I think the guy in the White House is everything our founding fathers feared. And Monica, I believe that in my bones, which is why for, and by the way, Monica, Hey, Mitt Romney, John Kasich, where are you? There were better Republicans to take this guy on, this horrible human being on, who's unfit to be president. I, I wrote an op-ed in your newspaper, the New York Times, in August, pleading for a Republican to do this. Some Republican needs to be out there every day calling him unfit. Romney didn't step up. Kasich, none of them stepped up. And by the way, they all agree with me. Monica, when I called Donald Trump a pathological liar, most of the Republicans in the House and Senate, privately, they agree with me. Nobody stepped up. I stepped up. And I have no idea what's going to happen to me. Um, you're describing President Trump as unfit for office. Yeah. But you've had your own questionable uh, comments in the past. Right. You've, you've made comments, anti-Muslim and racist comments on Twitter and other places. What's to say that, what makes you different than Donald Trump? L let me address that. But let me, and I, let me be really clear, because it's a serious charge to call a president unfit. The reason I think Donald Trump is unfit is twofold. He can't tell the truth. I mean, that, 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 that's really scary. And Donald Trump is incapable of putting the country's interest ahead of his own. That's really scary. 
Um, and we, we've seen that from the moment he got elected. Russia screwed with our elections. Donald Trump didn't acknowledge it and didn't do a damn thing about it because Donald Trump didn't want his own election tarnished. He cannot put the country's interest ahead of his own. That's why he's unfit. Look, I announced, Monica, at the end of August that I'm going to challenge him. And, and I was really clear that I'm not a perfect candidate. Mm -hmm. And I've been very clear since I challenged Donald Trump that I helped lead to Trump. I've apologized for the role that I played putting him in the White House. I mean that. What about for your own comments, though? That, Are that's you what fit I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I went to Washington in 2010, part of the Tea Party class. I went there to raise hell against both political parties. I was in a fight against the debt and a lot of issues. And in that fight, Monica, I stepped over the line a bunch. In and what way is I that? said ugly personal things. I engaged in ugly personal politics more than I'm proud of. Um, I went on the radio for five or six years. I continued my fight about things I believe in genuinely, but oftentimes, not often, but I said things over the line against Republicans or Democrats, personal ugly politics that I feel bad about. And I think some of that ugly personal politics that I engaged in and other members of the Tea Party and other members, other politicians helped give us the ugliest iteration of that, because that's all Donald Trump is. So I helped lead to that. And all I can do, Monica, is own what I've said, mm -hmm. um, apologize where it's, where it's worthy, and explain what I meant. But absolutely, some of my rhetoric helped lead to Trump. And for that, I've got to live with that. Who are some people that you owe apologies to? Uh, if, if President Barack Obama were sitting right there, I'd be He's on the knees. He's not, but yes. He's not. He, he'd, I mean, he'd be at the front of the list. I went to Congress. Right, you, said and, that, you said that you believed he was Muslim, yeah, I, I, that I, he was I, not born. And, and I got personal with him. I went to Congress in 2010. He was the president. Uh, and, and maybe some of you won't believe this, and I wasn't the only one, Monica, but a lot of us, it really, it was a policy fight, and I was mad at both parties, but Obama was president, and oftentimes in that political fight, I would personalize it. I'd love to be able to personally apologize to Obama for some of the things I said about him. When he'd increase the debt or the deficit, and I'd yell at him, and I'd say, you don't like, you don't like America, President Obama. I mean, now when I look back on stuff like that, that's a horrible thing to say. Um, there are others. And I went after, look, I was an equal opportunity. I'd go after Republicans and Democrats. So what's the distinction between you and Donald Trump? Watch this. I am genuinely sorry for things I've said. <laughs> I'm going to walk off the stage right now, and I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be cute. Is there anybody in the audience who's ever heard this guy in the White House apologize about anything? No. Look, this has been the hardest thing I've ever done. It's like I'm walking around naked, Monica, for, <laughs> in the five months that I've announced, because part of what I've had to do is apologize for the role I played in putting him there. Um, I think that's a big distinction. Here's the other distinction I'd make, and this is important. Look, uh, don't for a minute think that Trump divided America. The country was divided before Trump. He's the ugly product of the divide. I was at the, I've been at the front lines, Monica, for 10 years in that divide. I consider myself to be a bit of a reformed outlaw. I've found my way. Watching Donald Trump for three years, watching all of his ugly, cruel, bigoted tweets, has, I mean, I've done some soul searching. I don't want to sound like that. Uh, I, I've changed my tone because of Donald Trump. But the country is divided, and I'm a very outspoken leader on one side of that divide. So I think I'm uniquely positioned to say, I've screwed up, I've made mistakes, I've said horrible things, I regret them, now let's come together and talk about policy. So where do you think this divide goes? You're describing a divide out there in the country, and we're thinking about what is the future of the Republican Party. What do you see ahead? Well, the country will never begin to unify as long as this horrible, unfit human beings in the White House. So, so nothing begins, Monica, until he's gone. 
because he's utterly incapable of doing anything but divide us more. If he's gone, and I think he will be gone, if I don't beat him in the primary, a Democrat is going to beat him in the general. When he's gone, then the Republican Party is in a lot of trouble because I got to watch my language. So it's okay. I, Feel free. No, these, I don't think I can say the word chicken shit. But, <laughs> but if I did, I'd be talking about people like Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and all of these other Republicans, and now Nikki Haley. All of these other Republicans, Monica, who privately believe what I say about Trump, and they don't like Trump. And by the way, a lot of them, they don't want Trump to win because, Monica, they want him gone. They know Donald Trump is killing the Republican brand. But these, and I'm not going to say the word chicken shit, but these, these, these Republicans in my party who are keeping, they're hiding under the stage right now. They're waiting for Trump to lose in November. And then they think they can stand up and the good old Republican Party can come back. Uh, they're blind. They're naive. Because unless he's in jail, Donald Trump's not going anywhere. Donald Trump will not go anywhere. He's going to be around for a long, long time. So let's talk about what you're seeing among Iowa voters and New Hampshire voters, yeah. the places you are going. When you come to Republicans and you say some of this, what response are you getting? Um, there's a lot of anger among his core supporters that I'm taking on their king, their president, their leader. There are some Republicans that I just can't reach. I acknowledge that. Um, there's disappointment because a lot of Republicans look at me and say, Joe, you were one of us, man. You were one of us, good, solid, strong conservatives. Uh, so there's disappointment, and then people get angry at me. But, Monica, I've been blown away, blown away, blown away. I'm going to say it again. If Democrats can't stand Trump, rightly, and independents don't like him, Republicans are tired of him. I don't know what that means, How do you Monica. know that? They where, tell where? Me, no, they tell me that. When? When do they tell you Every that? time I'm out, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say that 70 to 80 percent of the Republicans that I've spoken to in Iowa and in New Hampshire have told me privately, I like some of the stuff he's done, Joe, but I can't imagine living through four more years of this chaos. So your prediction, assuming that you do not end up being the Republican nominee, what do you see happening in November of 2020? Um, I, I'm a contrarian on this. I don't think it matters who the Democrat nominee is. What happens? They I think win? Donald Trump loses. And who are you going to vote for? Well, I cannot and will not vote for Trump, obviously. <laughs> I mean, I think the guy's unfit. Um, and I'm not trying to be cute or coy, uh, but I'd rather have a socialist in the White House than this dictator. So you'll vote for a Democrat, whoever the Democrat is? I will not vote for Donald Trump. So, I'm not trying to be coy. I'm not trying to be coy. So is, is this really think going anywhere? Think about what I just said. <laughs> Monica, think about no, what I just coy. said. You're not being coy. I'm a Tea Party conservative, and I just said I'd rather have a socialist in the White House because I believe this guy is the biggest threat this country has ever had. So for, Everybody can take the next step. For, for those who hear this and kind of don't believe, because they kind of don't think you can win, and they've heard you support him, and they think you're trying to sell oh. a book or you're trying to do oh. something else. How, how do you respond to that? There, <laughs> I, there no, are, I've no, read no, a lot. I, no, I know, and I, <laughs> I, I love this question. Like, Joe, you're doing this to make money. Oh, my God. If I wanted to make money, I'd be an idiot like Sean Hannity. If, 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 if I wanted to make money, Monica, I'm not kidding. If I wanted to make money, I'd stay on talk radio, I'd say, Don, every day, I'd say, Donald Trump is the greatest thing in the world. Mega, mega, mega. He can do no wrong. I'd be invited to the White House. I'd be one of the most popular guys on the radio. I'd have four books published already. I'd be on Fox News all the time. I'd be famous if I supported Donald Trump. So when these people tell me that I'm doing this to benefit myself financially, this has been the most difficult thing I've ever done in my whole entire life. So what sorts of threats, anger, um, unhappiness from neighbors, friends, voters, what have you heard? What have, um, what's the worst? But, well, at, at home, people who know me the best, huge disappointment. You're a traitor. You're a traitor to the cause. Uh, and I understand it. 
and they consider the Democrats to be the enemy. From a lot of my former colleagues in the House, absolute disgust with what I'm doing. They've told me that privately. Um, what are you thinking? You, Elizabeth Warren is going to be president? Joe, what the hell are you doing? And so it runs the gamut from that to I want to kill you to um, real anger. Have you really been threatened? Yeah. With, okay. Absolutely. How have you handled that? Uh, you handle it professionally. I mean, you alert the authorities. What did you learn, stepping back from pre-2016, what did you learn from being in Congress? Um, that uh, neither political party has the courage to deal with the biggest problems in this country. And if that doesn't change, this country, um, I, I, I fear for. We're $23 trillion in debt right now, and it's only going to get worse. Nothing can get done without leadership, and I don't see any leadership in either political party. To you, how important is loyalty, and what is loyalty? Ah, that's a great question, Monica. To me, I'm loyal to the Constitution. I'm loyal to issues. I believe in freedom and limited government. I believe in opportunity. Like when people say, and this is the damnedest thing about this, the Republican Party's not a party. It is a cult right now. It's a cult. It is, Monica. It is. Because I pledge allegiance to the Constitution. I believe in what our founders believed in. We rebelled against a king. Now we have a king in the White House. And my, you know, when Barack Obama was president, Every time the deficit went up, every quarter, me and Jim Jordan and Mark Meadows and all of us Republicans, we'd hold press conferences and we'd yell at Obama for his debt. Those guys don't give a damn about the debt anymore because Trump's president. I am loyal to our founding principles in the Constitution. When I was sworn in, I swore to defend the Constitution. I'm not exaggerating right now. My fellow Republicans in the House and Senate, they, they, are, they are loyal to this president no matter what. That is so sad. Let's think That's a little so bit sad. about um, impeachment. So you, you already said that you favor impeachment. You think that's reasonable. How do you see this playing out, proceeding? Um, I, I thought he should have been impeached after I read the Mueller report. Remember the Mueller report like 10 years ago? <laughs> My God, the President of the United States obstructed justice over and over and over. Um, and I love the whole impeachment question because it's so clear to the American people. The President of the United States pressured a foreign government to help him cheat in the 2020 election. If that's not impeachable, nothing is. So when you talk to Iowans about that, what do they say? Most Republicans disagree with me on impeachment. Yeah. Even more so than they agree broadly. Yes. Of, in, of a so when we talk about impeachment, they get angry at me. And then usually I try to segue into, well, do you want four more years of Trump? And that's where we find more common ground. They're tired of the soap opera. But generally, they don't believe he should be impeached. Um, if I were still in Congress, I would have voted to impeach him. I would have been the only Republican who would have voted to impeach him. Uh, I am afraid that the Republicans in the Senate um, are going to do whatever Mitch McConnell generally tells them what to do. But John Bolton yesterday, I'll t John Bolton, <laughs> you don't need a damn subpoena. You're an American. Go volunteer and testify. But baby steps, he, he said, if you subpoena me, I'll testify. There may be three or four Republicans that demand a witness or two. You believe no, that? No, I'm not. I'm, Monica, I'm not confident. It seems to me you're describing, though, two different things. On the one hand, people in lockstep with the administration. On the other hand, that there's sort of this shadow group of people who are very unhappy and whisper that quietly to you, which is true. Well, I think they're both true. I mean, when you, when you poll Republican voters right now, self-identified Republicans, 80% support Trump. And think about that. Trump still has to lie about that. 95%, but about 80%. But these are self-identified Republicans. So many people have left the Republican Party, and I hear from a lot of those. But you're, you're, uh, you're Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz, and you know Trump's got most of the base. They're not afraid, Monica, of Trump. They don't like Trump. They think he's a moron privately, all of that. They're afraid of Trump's voters. Because if they stuck their neck out like I'm doing right now, 
um, Trump's voters would rebel against them in the fall. That's what they're worried about. Um, Iran, do you support what the administration no. did? No. Why? Um, because I think it's going to get more Americans killed. It, 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 and, and I think it's going to drag us further into that part of the world. And I don't think we should be dragged further into that part of the world. Look, is Soleimani a bad guy? Yeah, he's a bad guy. The only question that matters is, was it a smart thing to do? And I don't think it was. And we certainly know that this, you can't put Trump and the words Trump and strategy in the same sentence. I mean, he's got no clue what he's doing. That should be a major concern. I worry about it big time. And how do you see it playing out now? Oh, I think Iran's smart. I think they know how to respond to us asymmetrically. What they did last night was right. nothing. I think they're planning months out right now other attacks on this country to respond and retaliate and try to drag us further into that region. And what effects do you think that, part, that action has on the election and the campaign? Well, it's interesting. There can often be a rally around the flag, but I'll, I'll tell you, across party lines, and I'm a non-interventionist, I don't want our military all over the place. I think across party lines, what I hear mostly from people, and I think it's reflected in the polls, there ain't no hunger or desire for us to get involved in any sort of a war. So I think it would hurt Trump. And again, Trump's a unique animal. And this goes back to how dangerous it is that you can't believe a word he says. He spoke today, you can't believe a word he says. Um, the American people understand, I think innately, that with him at the helm, most of the American people, this is really dangerous. That's gonna hurt him. How long do you stay in this? Um, as long as we can, until I can't see a path to win. And you see a path to win today. Oh, oh yeah. And again, I, I'm not going to say that this is automatic. You're looking at the next Republican nominee right here. This is a fight. This is a battle. But I'm keeping my head down. I think we have an opportunity to surprise people in Iowa. There's dissatisfaction with Trump in Iowa. Uh, and I th it's my hope, Monica, that the day after Iowa, people wake up and they say, wow, somebody is running against Trump. What percent would that be for you? I got, in Iowa. I got yelled at by my campaign team because I put out a number once. Okay, you can do it they again. Said, don't. <laughs> they said, don't ever do that. Well, what would be success? I, I, Otherwise, I mean, I don't think you're, you're not likely to win based on everything. I, that, so what would be 15%? I don't know. I don't know. A number that would surprise people. If I got 15% of the vote in Iowa, yeah. would that make you go, whoa? I don't know. I don't I'm know. asking you the questions. I don't questions. know. I, I, I think it, I'm looking for a number that would make people go, what wow. What would you ma make you go, wow? What would make you say, okay, this was a worth it? A number that would make people go, wow. <laughs> We're getting nowhere here. We're going to keep playing but, this game. Will you, um, uh, where will you do better, uh, New Hampshire or Iowa? Or, um, and will you, will you really even make a mark at all yes. in either of those states? Yes, we have to do well in Iowa to help us in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And I, because doing, surprising people in Iowa will give us some moment, momentum going into New Hampshire. And then because Donald Trump canceled a bunch of primaries, then there's nothing on the Republican side until Super Tuesday. And in states like Texas and California and Colorado, there's real Republican dissatisfaction with them. So there is a path, but it's going to be difficult. How much money are you raising? Not much. It's hard. I, I, again, I, I can't tell a lie. This has been the most difficult part of it because I, I, I've spoken to so many Republican big-time donors. Again, like my former colleagues, privately, Joe, I can't stand Trump. I want him to lose. He's bad for the country, but I'm not going to give you any money. Um, so there's been like, like Fox News has blackballed me. A, a lot of the Republican, the Republican donors haven't given us money. So we've had to just hustle out there as much as we can, but it's been difficult. So let's talk a little bit about your radio career in case that turns out to be oh, something geez. you return to. Um, well, first of all, will you? And tell us, explain the lay of the land if you are a conservative radio show host, what you can and can't say now and why. Uh, 
I lost my radio show when I announced. But that was because you're running for office. Yes. I was going to lose my radio show no matter what. Why? Uh, because I was in conservative talk radio. And if you are a conservative talk radio host, baby, you got to line up on Team Trump. Where you, is that written down? Who? who I'm, how does that play well, out? Well, I'm specifically me. I'm told that by the company I work for. I want you to speak positive of, of Trump. If you can't, uh, there were certain issues I was told don't talk about. If you can't praise Trump on this issue, don't talk about Trump. And is that a reflection of the listeners? They don't want to hear you. Yeah, but uh, that, that, that's a really good question, Monica, because my audience changed over the last couple of years. In Obviously, what way? I, I lost some loyal Trump supporters. Right. But we got a, a lot of independents and even right and left leaning people started to listen to us because they wanted it. They knew at least they were getting the truth. But no, I, again, every day I'd get beaten up over the head by my company uh, and oftentimes by listeners, you gotta be more pro-Trump. So when you ask me if I'm gonna go back into talk radio, there's no place in conservative talk radio for my voice, none. And remember, again, remember, I don't think Trump's going away. So he's still going to be here even when he loses in 2020. Okay, but how does this play out long term? Let's think 10 years from now. What is the landscape for the Republican Party? What does that look like then? I think, I think, I think there's going to be a Republican Party bloodbath. I think there's going to be a cleansing. Um, because... And I'm not alone. This guy in the White House doesn't stand for why I was a Republican. There are more Joe Walsh's out there. A lot of them are hiding right now. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. If Trump loses, I think you'll see a lot of them come out. I think there will be a fight for the soul of the Republican Party. I don't know how it will work out. Um, but I think it's going to be ugly for a while. And again, I go back to guys like Rubio and all the rest of them. This is not going to be mourning in America for the Republican Party this December if Trump loses. It's going to be a long, protracted fight. And so what is your plan? What happens after this? What do you do? Personally, I don't know. I honestly don't, Monica. I really don't. I, I, I did not take that into, I think my wife's here and she's listening. I didn't <laughs> take that into consideration. I'm doing what I think I need to do. Um, I want to be a voice in this fight. I believe in freedom, and I believe in limited government, and I believe in opportunity for all. Uh, I believe in a strong border, but I don't believe in this bigot and racist in the White House who told four brown-skinned congresswomen to go back to where they came from. This guy has hijacked issues that Republicans genuinely have a concern for, and he's taken them down a dark, ugly place. I know no matter what I'm going to be doing after this, I want to be in the fight for, and, and this country, Monica, needs two political parties. Right now we have a party and we have a cult. And as long as this thing is a cult, the country's worse off for that. And are you the best person to be reflecting oh, the other side of that? Oh, I'm, I'm one person. I hope I'm one voice. Are you the best person to be, to be standing a, up for this? I think I'm, I, I think I'm a damn good voice. And, and the reason I think I am, Monica, is what's the best? I think I'm a good voice because I've been in the fight for 10 years. I've seen the light. I've seen the error of my ways. I've publicly apologized for five months for some of my behavior the last eight to 10 years. I, I mean, I think that's a unique voice to be part of the fight. So what do you stand for? You were a Tea Party person. You talked a lot about fiscal issues back when. Now you're talking Still. about being, you're essentially representing an anti-Trump candidacy. Yeah. What do you stand for? I stand for the same things I stood for when I went to Congress. But you changed your mind on a bunch of them, but no, not these other ones? Not on but issues. On Trump, but not on. Uh, oh God. So, so well, you're well, a fiscal it, yeah, person? Yeah, and, and, and Monica, this goes, this goes to how the world has changed in Trump land. Prior to Trump, on the Republican side, you were either a conservative or you were a rhino, a squish. Right. And it was all based on where you stood on the issues. I was a conservative because of where I was on the issues. 
Now, with Trump, it's where do you stand on Trump? So now people call me a squish. People call me a rhino. People call me an establishment Republican. People call me a socialist. It's like Trump now is the dividing line, not where you stood on the issues. I still stand for limited government. I stand for balanced budgets. I stand for a strong border. I stand for low taxes. I stand for the same things I stood for when I went to Congress in 2010. But because I oppose Trump, I'm now the rhino. What's the future of the Tea Party? Is that, does that still exist? Does anyone know what that word means anymore? Or is that? It's, uh, it, and this is important. The Tea Party's kind of asleep right now, but. Well, where are they? Uh, Trump has co-opted them. And I think this is an important point, coming from a Tea Party person. The, the, there were two prongs to the Tea Party movement. There was the fiscal, anti-debt, anti-big government. And that's what animated me. But there was also a populist strand. Mm -hmm. uh, sick of the Democrats, sick of the elites, sick of Obama, punch everybody in the face. Donald Trump represents that populist strand. And he tapped into mm -hmm. that a few years ago. He demagogued it. And so right now, most of the Tea Party is all about the populist punch. And they've forgotten their wares on the issues. Who's your favorite Democrat? Of the presidential candidates, who would you really pick if you could? Okay, the new Joe Walsh? I don't know. I just no, the I'm real give, Joe I'm going to give you the new Joe Walsh. I, I like and respect all of them. Uh, Joe Biden is real comfortable. Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, I got a lot of respect for because they are what they believe and they put their beliefs out there. Pete Buttigieg is one hell of an interesting candidate. I really liked Julian Castro. I was sad to see him go. Cory Booker's got a lot going for him. It's too bad his message isn't resonating. It's a really, oh, oh Amy Klobuchar I love. So, <laughs> I, I, it, are... I mean, I like Amy Klobuchar. She, by the way, Democrats in the House, she's a Democrat man who can kick Trump's butt in the Midwest. I mean, kick his butt. I right, think we're, they all can. We're going to go to questions in just a second. But, but uh, so you all get your questions ready. And in the meanwhile, so if you had to pick from among them, and you could you could get your top choice, and you were going in and voting this as a Democrat because you like all of them. Which oh, it's one that what, I it want. shows what you believe in. Okay. What, which person's policies do you believe the can most? Can I add a nuance to your question? <laughs> Are you talking about who I want? to face Trump? Who do you think would I be think? the best leader of the country if you picked one of the Democrats? Ooh, I don't, this will hurt Amy Klobuchar. If I could pick Amy Klobuchar president tomorrow, I would. Okay, thank you. All right, let's have some questions and we're gonna take the first three from students. So I hope you'll say your name and that you're a student. <laughs> Hi. And then proceed with your question. Um, my name is Henry. I'm a fourth year undergrad here. Um, thank you, here. Henry. Um, as a Jewish American, I've been really worried about the increase in anti-Semitic and racist hate crimes in this country in recent years. Um, you have called um, white supremacy and racism evil. You've said it needs to be called out. Um, you've also, I think, rightly tied um, actions and rhetoric from the president to events like the El Paso shooting. Um, but we've also been talking tonight about how all of your Republican colleagues pretty much have fallen in lockstep behind the president. So do you think that the Republican Party today is worthy of condemnation for helping to stoke anti-Semitism, racism, and white nationalism in this country? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, anti-Semitism is a big issue to me. My wife is Jewish. I love the state of Israel. I want to retire and die in Israel. Um, when I was in Congress, I, I, I wanted to be the most pro-Israel member of Congress. Anti-Semitism you find on the right and the left. That's what's, per the far right and the far left. That's what's particularly dangerous about anti-Semitism. There's no denying the fact, and there's no de denying the evidence that we've seen a huge uptick of anti-Semitism on the right. And people in my party, the Republican Party, and us good, decent conservatives have to acknowledge that we, there is an ugly strain, there is a white supremacy strain on our far right. There is an alt-right that is anti-Jew, anti-black, anti-everything, but like, like it is a real white nationalist thing. And, and, and we have to, I mean, condemn that in the strongest language. And clearly, this president doesn't. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a concern. But, but again, again, Henry, don't move. Yes. Ah, 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 ah. I don't expect any better from Trump. But don't you expect better from the no, Republican that's where I'm Party? Going. Maybe you and I are on the same page. I mean, that's it's... exactly where I'm going. Trump doesn't care. Trump is a horrible human being. I expect more from my fellow Republicans. I expect more from the Republican Party. But like with every other issue, my friend, they've been afraid to go against Trump. It is shameful. Do you think they've been afraid, or do you think that there's like a real problem with no. racist views in the Republican Party? No, yes, there are racist views in the Republican Party. Let's be honest, though. Thanks, man. Thank you. There are racist views all over this country, across the spectrum. I do believe mostly it is fear. It's fear from Trump and his retribution. When, just you. thinking about that for one second, about racism, you have made comments in the past that, that certainly appeared Absolutely. to be racist. How do you make sure to, how do you convince people that that's not what because, you really believe? Because I love and am obsessed with the issue of race. If you and I sat down for three hours and we looked at everything I've said about race, yeah. you, 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 you'd have a much different idea of where my head is. I, I had a podcast for a year called Uncomfortable Conversations. It was me, white radio guy, and Mays Jackson, by the way, who you should listen to, morning host on WVON right here. He's a black radio guy. We'd get together for an hour and we'd talk about issues of race, black guy and white guy, because I am obsessed, Monica, with the fact that white people and black people don't talk about race. So I talk about race a lot, because I care about it. And like everything else, sometimes when I talk about an issue, I sometimes I go too far. But my heart's in the right place, because I want this country to heal and deal with this issue of race. I really do. Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm a second year, in, uh, second year undergrad. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question that's asked a lot of the 2020 Democratic presidential nominee, or, uh, candidates. Uh, what will you do as your first thing in if you get into office? Miracle, miracle. If I became president? If you became president, what's the first thing you do in office? Very first thing I do, and I would implore the Democrat nominee to do this as well. This country is divided right now. I would take a week, I would take a weekend, and I would hole up with the top Democrats and the top Republicans, and we'd go somewhere for a week, and we'd break bread, and we'd hold hands, and we'd get back, I mean it, and we'd get back to where we're debating and talking about issues. And then we'd, hey, 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 and then we'd come, and by the way, I want to get back to that place. I, if Elizabeth Warren is president, I want to have a respectful debate with Elizabeth Warren about free college. I want this country to get back to talking about the issues. All we do with that jackass in the White House is talk about Trump. So the first thing I do is bring both parties together and then present the American people with both parties together, telling the American people that from this point forward, we're going to have engaging, respectful conversations about the issues. And then I would lead on the entitlement crisis. Boom. <laughs> it's always doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Olafur. I'm a first year here in um, the undergraduate division. Um, I'm wondering, so we've talked a lot about uh, sort of Trump's personality tonight. Um, in terms of policy, um, what sort of of his major initiatives do you agree with and what do you disagree with? And yeah, why? good question. Because I fall into the trap because, look, I think Trump's unfit. If I, and this is my trap, if I just disagreed with Trump on some issues, I wouldn't be running against him in the primary. I think he's an existential threat. Uh, his tariffs are horrible and they're killing American farmers and American manufacturers right now. Donald Trump is increasing the debt. I mean way faster than Obama did. That's outrageous. Donald Trump has made our situation at the border much worse than it was when he got in. Those three issues right there, and I think he's a nut around the world, on the world stage. Um, though, but those three domestic issues I would move to do something about right away. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dave, and I'm not a student here. Uh, I, I just want to say, Joe, thank you. I appreciate oh, your apology you. because I've not heard one from a Republican yet. 
So thank you. I, don't, I appreciate that. Someone said to me this morning, and I'll put you on the spot. Someone said to me this morning that in order to be a Republican, you're going to have to be a Democrat first. How would you respond to that? I, I get it. Um, I don't know if the Republican Party is going to make it. I don't know if I'll be a Republican if I don't become the nominee. And there's still a path, Monica. <laughs> you know, she's, she's writing down, there's no path. There's no path. There's no, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. Um, I don't know if I'm not the nominee. I don't know if I'll be a Republican in a year, honestly. And a lot of people feel that way. Now, could Joe Walsh find a home in the Democrat Party? I don't know. Um, Have you always been a Republican? <laughs> I've always been libertarian, conservative leaning. Uh, but when I ran for Congress in 2010, I said I'm a Tea Party conservative first, a Republican second. I was pissed off at the Republican Party back then. When um, you went here to policy school, when you went to the Harris School, were you, were you a registered Republican? I was probably a registered Republican, yeah. Um, the Democrat Party's going through their fight, and it's a good, healthy fight, because they're fighting about issues. Um, I think you will see, here's the deal. If Trump wins in 2020, I think you'll see a bunch of Republicans go to the Democrat Party. And by the way, if Trump's the nominee, you're gonna, I don't care who the Democrat nominee is, you're going to see a bunch of Republicans vote for that Democrat nominee. I know Joe Biden loves to say they're all going to vote for me if I'm the nominee. I think privately a lot of Republicans will vote for whoever the Democrat nominee is. Thank you. What issue do you think, I don't mean to take up your time, but what issue do you think a, a Democratic candidate should pick as the one that is going to make that difference, the one they can win on? I just, Monica, I, and I know there are smarter people that, that run, and know how to run campaigns, and I don't. To me, this is just all about Trump. It, it is. And, and I know some people laughed when I said this, but I want you to think about it. We have a horrible human being in the White House. My kids are older. I can't imagine having young kids now and trying to explain to my young kids what this guy does every day. I think that supersedes everything. I think if we can get back to a place again where we're talking about trade and college and all that, I think all the Democrat. if I were a Democrat candidate, I'd say, man, I want to bring people together. We'll talk about all these issues. But this guy is a threat. I think the Democrat candidate that can really go at the threat that Donald Trump is more I think that's going to be the more successful candidate. But what to your I question. Mean? Sure, not a student. And I like how Joe's saying all the time, Monica. So I would say, Monica, I will <laughs> ask a question now to Joe. <laughs> and, and he mentioned so often Republican Party. And from 2000 till 2020 now, we have two uh, Republican um, presidents. All of them, both of them are idiots. And this is, everybody knows this. It's bona fide idiots. So how Republican Party successfully elect idiots all the time? <laughs> and maybe this is, should be linked to your last sort of thing, that you live in Republican Party, it will be different Republican Party, and so on. You and I got to have a beer after this. <laughs> sure. Um, give me this, my uh, august audience, in defense of Republican voters out there. And, and I felt this. I was a Republican member of Congress. I was a conservative. When you're a conservative like I am, generally most people in academia are more left of center. Most people in the media are more left of center. Uh, most people, it, it's fine. Uh, most, most people in, in higher ed are left of center. Most people in our big, in, most people in big corporate America are left of center. Republican voters have felt this for so long. All these elites and all these institutions are against us. Along comes a demagogue. I'm going to punch them. I'm going to call CNN fake news. Yeah, baby, I want that. I'm going to go after the New York Times. I'm going to go after all these elite institutions. He was a demagogue. 
but that really appealed to a lot of them because they felt beat up by a lot of this. I think that's why they turned to an utter idiot, to an absolute moron. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Pass. Next question. At, 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 at Helsinki, uh, Trump said, I'm with Putin. And in the call to Zelensky, Trump was trying to coerce Zelensky to agreeing with what really is the Putin big lie that Ukraine hacked the DNC, not Russia. But can you envision another article of impeachment based on looking at the evidence of Trump's finances that the reason that Trump is so pro-Putin is because he has been bought, that, for example, Russians guaranteed his loans with Deutsche Bank. Yeah. But my question is really, supposing that pivotal evidence comes out, which Mueller didn't find and the House uh, hasn't even sought it for impeachment yet, uh, will Republicans, are Republicans so in the tank that they'll even support Trump in spite of being bought by Russia? I, I think, unfortunately, most Republicans are too in the tank. Um, but his finances and much of Donald Trump's life is being investigated in various courts. But this, this, is, a, this is such an important point. Um, I called Donald Trump a traitor on some TV show about a month ago. And I meant, broadly speaking, this is so scary. He is a traitor. In 2016, he encouraged Russia to screw with our elections. And, and then he did whatever he could do to stop the investigation into what Russia did. This year, he told China to screw with our elections. This year, he pressured Ukraine to screw with our elections. What do you call a president who demands and asks and pressures foreign entities to mess with our stuff. Broadly speaking, that's traitorous. Why, and this is so depressing, Monica, because <laughs> again, most of my former colleagues, deep down, most of them get that. They just don't say it. But, but you know, it does make, didn't, did you know some of this in 2016 when you voted for him? Well, not, not, the, not, not the, the whole Russia stuff. But I'm saying the, 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 you understood who, your description of him is extremely strongly worded. Did you see a different person before? You know, I'm having fun with her, but now she's making me apologize again. And the, no, Monica, Monica, you're right. Just trying to understand no, the transformation. It's no, confusing. Monica, you are exactly right. Um, I made a mistake voting for him. I made a bigger... But did you no, know? Did no, you feel no, no. the same way? To your point, I made a bigger mistake not paying attention to who he was. Um, I didn't support him in the primary. I voted for Rand Paul in the Republican primary here. But, but then Trump becomes the nominee. I'm on, the I'm on talk radio. I don't like Hillary. Trump says some things I like, like I'm going to disrupt the swamp or whatever. I didn't pay attention. I just got caught up in the conservative. It's Trump against Hillary. Ah, who cares? I should have. I didn't even know what his reality TV show was. I didn't pay attention to him in the 80s and 90s. I dropped the ball, and I should have paid more attention to what a bad guy he was. Do you think Absolutely. that that's what's going on with your colleagues that you talk about, the voters that no! you talk about, that they're not paying attention? They're paying oh. attention to the parts that. That no, no, because their now, policy needs. No, because and, now he's been in our face every day for three years. And he's not hiding. He tweets this crap. I mean, he tweets his ugliness every day now. So, no, there's no missing right now uh, what a liar, what a narcissist, what a dishonest traitor Donald Trump is. You can't miss that now. Nobody has an excuse now. Let's go on to the next question. Joe, my name is Aris. I'm a student in the business school. Hey, Aris. Uh, my question is that you've said that there are two strains to the Tea Party, the, the fiscal conservatives and the populists, and that the populists have maybe co-opted the party. Do you, think, do you really think that it's as simple as pulling them back to your light of fiscal conservatism, or do you have any fear that the two sides are showing themselves to be one and the same? That's a good question. I think it's, there's a healthy mix. I think there's a healthy overlap. Because I'm more driven by the fiscal conservative. 
And I got to be honest, I was surprised at how easily, easily Trump could grab these people and demagogue them with his, I'm going to punch back everybody, and CNN's the enemy of the people. I'm disappointed and surprised by how uh, easy it was for Trump to grab them. So my fear, maybe yours, that that populist strand is even stronger than, than I thought. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris. I am not a student. Um, thanks for so, coming. Thanks. I'm, I'm kind of in agreement with a lot of what you say as far as our, the state of our politics, the state yeah. of our democracy. And to me, I, I get the sense that the heart of it is kind of economics in the sense. I, I'm a believer in um, the sense of a social contract between a democracy, the government, and its people. Yeah. And I get the sense that's not in its um, strongest state at the moment. Um, at this moment, um, we have a lot of young people who can't participate in the economy because right. there's a big debt burden. Right. This is going to be, I think, the first generation where young people will not um, progress as far as their parents. At the same time, um, you hear reports about the top 500 companies in America, 396 of them have tax havens. Yeah. Um, you hear about there's a number of wealthy corporations that have not paid taxes in the last couple of years, and it seems like inequality is growing at an um, unprecedented level. And I'm wondering for you as a presidential candidate, what do you think is necessary to, um, I guess, get our economics and uh, get, yeah. get our state of affairs in order? Uh, good question. Great question. Uh, and again, I'll go back to, I think, almost where we started. What animates me right now is the number 23 trillion. The country's $23 trillion in debt. I'm an old white guy. When you're my age, I don't think you're gonna, I worry that you won't have Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. Right now, I mean, those programs are on a road to bust. Uh, and neither political party wants to do anything about them. And, and we've got the country, respectfully, a lot of these good Democrat candidates, I respect the hell out of them, talking about free college and, and, and expanding our government health care. I'm fine with that discussion, but part of that discussion has to be, well, how are we going to pay for it? Because I don't want to bankrupt my 29-year-old grandson. So we got to have that discussion, one, and then your other issue, income inequality. Because, in, in, look, in a, in a free society, a capitalist society like ours is, you're always going to have inequality. That's just a fact of life. But, but what do you do about it? Um, and that's an issue I think both parties need to come together on to make sure that, as you say, the wealthy aren't avoiding what they should be paying, but to also increase opportunity for people down here. And, and the two parties have different ideas on how to do that, but we got to have that discussion. Thank you. You know, in the conversation, you've talked several times about this very real division in the country. And I think that a lot of people have recognized that and seen it in a lot of different ways yeah. over the last four years, three years. But does that, how, how upsetting is, should that be? Is that simply a, a situation brought on by an administration? Or is that a reflection of just where the country really is? And so what is the solution to that? Where does that go? Well, I think it's really it's, distressing. I, I think it's really real. And again, just think about this. Donald Trump is president. If, if, if you need a piece of evidence number one at how divided and messed up our politics are, we put him in the White House. So again, there was something wrong. What is that thing that's wrong? I think that... Um, Many of, I think there is a divide in the country between elite people, maybe wealthy people, and people down here who feel like the government, the government isn't doing anything for me. CNN doesn't listen to me. Uh, I, I think there is a lot of that. But was that new? Hasn't that no, always been? Why, why, what is the new thing? Why did it feel so extreme, well, I can just so tell pronounced? You, in the 10 years that I've been on the scene, I, I've, I've felt it get worse to the point where, again, a demagogue could come along and just so easily touch it. Why did it get worse? Because of income inequality? Because of what? It, it, it might have been part of it, but I think it's also about a political system 
two political parties that are completely out of touch. Look, I've been rapping on Trump a lot, and I love going after Trump. Hillary Clinton was a poster child for an establishment, a political establishment, that really wasn't paying attention to people here. If Hillary had gone into Wisconsin and just listened to real people, white, black, and brown in Wisconsin, three or four more times, any time, she'd have beaten Trump in Wisconsin. But she didn't pay attention to them. Um, no, there's a real feeling, I think, in both political parties that both political parties no longer care about me. Uh, I think that's gotten worse. Because that was Trump's whole thing. I'll drain the swamp. <laughs> On to your question. Uh, my name is Corey Howard. Uh, hey, Corey. I'm a local activist. I've called your show a few times. I'm a registered libertarian. But oh. what I want to say is that there is no objectivity at all. It's like we blame the budget on Trump, but by the Constitution, Congress writes the budget. The House created it. The Senate messes around with it a bit. Then they send it to the president. It's literally Congress's fault. So we're sitting here now saying that this is Trump's budget. It is Congress's what, what, Corey, budget. what are you referring to in particular? What's Congress's fault in particular? Is there an issue or just all of them? No, per the Constitution, oh. all bills for revenue start in the House. The House yeah. engenders that budget. So to blame it on Trump is quite unfair. But it will consume one quarter of all tax receipts yeah. pretty soon. We're going down the wrong path. But the objectivity is missing because Trump is this big, shiny object. Look, I voted for the guy. I went to his inauguration. I'm going to vote for him again in 2020, but I would like to say let's get some objectivity here, please. We hear so much blaming back and forth, and I love it, to be perfectly honest with you, because when you guys aren't getting along, I mean, like Samuel Clemens said, you know, when Congress is in session, your property and your freedom is in jeopardy. And since you guys aren't getting along, my property and my freedom right now are pretty much protected. Well, So it, it seems like ahead, his man. question, though, is what role does Congress have? What, well, and, what blame and, should Congress? Court, kind of just to touch your point, and again, this didn't start with Trump. Our founding fathers right now would be blown away at how powerful the presidency is. Our founding fathers never envisioned the chief executive of this nation to be this powerful. And that's primarily happened, Monica, as you know, because over the last 50 to 60 years, Congress has abdicated and ceded their responsibility in so many areas to a president. That's a problem, and Congress has got to grab it back. Yes, sir. Thanks for being here tonight, Joe. Thank, Thank you, Monica. Uh, in the post-Trump era, whether that's in one year or five years, what will be the Republican strategy moving forward? I think that if I were king of the world and I were in charge of the Republican strategy after Trump, um, here's, here's the problem. I'm not that old. I always call myself an old white guy. All right, say, say I'm an old white guy. <laughs> <laughs> right now, the Republican Party is too much old white guys. And the problem with old white guys is we die. Um, and right now, young people want nothing to do with the Republican Party. Right now, people of color want nothing to do with the Republican Party. Right now, women want nothing to do with the Republican Party. Because the Republican Party says to these constituencies, we don't give a damn about you. All we care about is old white guys. So the Republican Party, if I were in charge, would hold firm to these fiscal issues. I mean, hold firm to them. But when it comes to a lot of the social issues, and by the way, to young people, we got to do a better job of saying this debt matters. To young people, we have to do a better job of saying free college for everybody isn't a good thing. We have to argue the issues, but then on the social issues, on a lot of the social issues, the Republican Party has got to be more embracing. I mean, myself included, right? We've got to be more embracing to people of color, the LGBT community, young people who care about climate change. We have to acknowledge it's an issue we ought to look at. Um, that's the challenge for the Republican Party. And if we don't do that, if we're not more tolerant toward people who don't look like me, man, the party's going to die. The party is going to die. Great question. All right. I think we need to wrap things up. I just want to thank you so much for being here. Give it up for Monica. Thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Good luck in Thank Iowa. You. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.